Thank you very much. What a uh, lovely venue and great crowd, and thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, I was uh, obviously listening to the remarks and wondering about the wisdom of an election night party <laughs> um, in a public space. Anyway, I just got invited to an election night party at my neighbor's house across the street. I've never... Um, been invited to an election night party, and uh, it's either going to be a potluck, or we're just going to have booze for supper. That's, if nobody has an appetite, I don't know, we'll see. We're going to talk about some more intelligent things this evening. And uh, basically, we're going to ask one question, try to answer one question, it is a question that I think that many of us have asked, and that question is, does my dog really love me, or does she just want a treat? <laughs> How many of you have asked that question? Well, <clears throat> jumping right to the answer, I think it's very easy to see that, of course, our dog loves us, and very easy to see what's going on in that furry little head. It's very easy to see <coughs> what's going on in that furry little head, right? <coughs> Maybe it's not so easy to see. But something's going on. You can't say nothing's going on. But the other thing is, why is the question always, do they love us? Why is the question always about us? Why are we such narcissists that our first question about them is actually about us? Isn't that odd? It's not odd. It's the way we are. So I needed a different question. And my question was, who are you? Who are you is a different question than, do you love me? There are capacities of the human mind. The question is, are these capacities only of the human mind? What's going on in these other big brains that share the world with us? Many people say, well, whether something's going on or not, you really can't ask that question because there's no way to answer it. But I think there are very good ways to answer this question, or at least address the question. One is you can look at brains, you can consider evolution, and you can just watch what they do. This happens to be a famous elephant researcher named Joyce Poole. That is not an elephant, that is a really big jellyfish. And the point of this slide is that the first nerve cells evolved in jellyfish. And then eventually jellyfish gave rise to chordates, which gave rise to vertebrates, which came out of the sea and built a beautiful public space in Seattle where we all are tonight. I know I'm skipping some steps. But it's still true that a nerve cell is basically a nerve cell. It's basically the same thing and it looks the same. Whether it is in a crayfish or a parrot or a human being. Well, what are the implications of that fact for the minds and mental experiences of something like a crayfish? Does the fact that their neurons are like our neurons mean much? Well, it turns out that if you give a crayfish a lot of little tiny electrical shocks, it will develop what looks like an anxiety disorder, and it will be afraid of coming out and exploring and afraid of looking for food. But if you put the same chemical used to treat anxiety disorder in humans into the water, 
the crayfish relaxes and comes out and begins exploring again. So, how do we consider the possibility of anxiety among crayfish? Mostly, we boil them. <laughs> Octopuses are mollusks, but they use tools as well as do most apes. And they recognize individual human faces. How do we honor the ape-like intelligence of octopuses? Mostly, we boil them. Oops, wait a second. What happened? There we go. Mostly, we boil them. Okay. There's a fish called a grouper. Well, there are many fish called groupers. When groupers chase a fish into a crevice in the rocks or the coral, they sometimes go to where they know a moray eel is sleeping. They have a way to signal to the moray eel, follow me. The moray understands and often follows. When the grouper gets to where the fish is hiding, it says, here. The moray will go into the crevice, and sometimes the moray will get the fish, and sometimes the fish will bolt, and the grouper will get the fish. This is an ancient trans-species partnership that's probably been going on for millions of years, and we have only known about it for about 10 years. And when I say we, I mean the 16 people who read that paper. <laughs> How do you think we honor this ancient interspecies partnership? Fried. <laughs> a pattern is emerging here, and the pattern says a lot more about our minds than it says about theirs. Teaching is when you take time away from what you're doing to show your child or your companion what to do. Chimpanzees do not teach. Young chimpanzees learn a lot from watching, but the older ones don't take time away to teach. But sea otters do teach. Killer whales teach, and killer whales share almost all the food that they catch. When our minds got to be what they are, they didn't just come out of nowhere. Our minds are elaborations on simpler minds, as you can see from the comparison between the mouse brain and the human brain. They're quite similar, but you can see that we are a quite elaborated version of that basic body plan. If you look at a human brain and a chimpanzee brain, you see that basically we have a large chimpanzee brain. And it's a good thing it's large, because we are also the most insecure of all the apes. But uh-oh, that's a dolphin. Bigger, more complicated. What does that mean for how they experience the world? It might mean not much. Maybe brains don't tell us anything about minds, really. Maybe most of that dolphin brain is devoted to analyzing sonar rather than thinking. Could be. But I do think that while you can't see the mind by looking at a brain, you can see the workings of a mind 
in the logic of behaviors. So, look at this scene. Can you tell me a little about what is going on there? Yes, it's pretty obvious. The elephants have found a patch of shade under the palm trees where they can let their babies go to sleep while the adults rest, but don't fully, they doze, but they don't fully get off their guard, and they're facing outward, and they're touching one another, because the world is dangerous. I can explain that to you, and you can see that that makes perfect sense of this scene, because it makes sense to us exactly as it makes sense to them. It is what they're doing, and they know what they're doing. That's why they went for the shade. These elephants don't look relaxed, because guess what? They're not relaxed. Something is concerning them. What could be concerning elephants? Well, it turns out that if you record the voices of people and you record tourists and Maasai tribesmen saying in their own language, look, there are some elephants, and you play the recording back through a hidden speaker in a bush, the elephants hearing the tourists ignore the tourists completely and don't do anything because tourists don't bother elephants. But when they hear the voices of the Maasai tribesmen, the recorded voices from the hidden speaker that doesn't smell like anything, it's just recorded voices, instead of ignoring them like they do to the tourist voices, the elephants bunch up and then run away because the Maasai carry spears and they get into confrontations with elephants at waterholes and they sometimes hurt them. Elephants know not only that there are different kinds of animals, including humans, they know that there are different kinds of humans and that some humans are harmless and others are very dangerous. They understand us much better than we understand them. They've been watching us carefully for a long time. We know each other because we basically have the same imperatives and under the arc of the same sun, listening to the whoops and the, war and the roars of the same dangers, we became who we are and they became who they are. We've been neighbors for a very long time. Our minds have developed together and being mammals, under the skin, we are quite similar. We have the same skeleton, we have the same organs, we have essentially an identical nervous system, we have the same life imperatives. Try to stay alive and find food, try to keep our babies alive. It's the same whether you are built for hiking in the hills of Kenya or built for diving in the waters of the Salish Sea. Under the skin, we are all kin. And so you see things like helping, where helping is needed. You see curiosity, mostly in the young. We easily recognize the deep bonds of family connection. We see affection, and we know what that is. Courtship is courtship. Dancing is dancing. All these similarities, all these connections, and then we ask, but are they conscious? Isn't that a very strange, dysfunctional kind of relationship that we have with the entire rest of the living world? 
I think it's actually quite bizarre. A scientist I know who is a bit senior to me told me that when he was coming up in the field of animal behavior, he was told that other animals are capable of detection, not perception. Basically, everything else in the living world is just one big motion sensor, and only we have any thoughts or emotions. But yes, they are conscious. What do I mean by conscious? Well, consciousness is the thing that feels like something. If you have a sensation, you're conscious. If you are connected to experiencing the input from your senses, you're conscious. When you get total anesthesia, it renders you unconscious. And then when you come out of it, you regain consciousness. The idea that animals with noses to smell with, eyes to see, ears to hear, who play with each other, might not be experiencing anything is entirely bizarre. It's psychotic. It has almost no connection at all to reality. Why do we tell ourselves these stories? As I was reading a lot about various kinds of research and thinking about animal behavior, I came upon this um, odd little sort of boutique industry, which I called the animal behavior Mad Libs, and it went like, blank makes us human. And different people tried to um, make their reputation, really, by saying that X makes us human. One of the things that they say makes us human is empathy. Empathy makes us human. Well, that's wrong. Empathy is the ability of a mind to match the mood of your companions. That's empathy. If you're living in a group and it's time to hurry up, you better hurry up. And you better feel suddenly like you're in a hurry and that is empathy. The oldest form of empathy is called contagious fear. Somebody startles and you, you get startled. It doesn't work if hundreds of your companions suddenly flee in panic and you stand there on the beach saying, gee, I wonder why everybody just left. <laughs> so that's the oldest form of empathy. I see empathy like I see everything in the living world is on a range. It's on a continuum. Empathy is one of those things. So I, I have sort of these three fuzzy categories, um, which I call basic empathy, the mood matching ability. And then the next sort of category along this scale is what I call sympathy, a little bit more removed. You are not experiencing the same kind of grief, but when you hear your friends say, my grandmother just died, you say, I'm sorry to hear your grandmother just died, because you understand that that person is suffering. And then if you try to act to end suffering, acting out of empathy and sympathy to end suffering, I call that compassion. So human empathy not only is not the defining trait of humanity, but human empathy is far from perfect. We round up other empathic animals and we kill them and we eat them. And now maybe you're saying, okay, well, I'm messing with your minds because here in the US we love dogs. We don't think of dogs as food. This is a culturally insensitive remark that I am making. This is, after all, just predation. Us eating other animals is simply predation which is not a terribly unnatural thing. Okay, I understand and I grant all of that. But we are not so great to one another either. People who seem to know only one thing about animal behavior 
seem to know that you may never attribute a human thought or a human emotion to a non-human. That's called anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is not allowed. But it is not scientific to say they're hungry when they're hunting, they're tired when their tongues are hanging out, but when they're playing with their families, we have no idea if they could possibly be even conscious or experiencing anything or have any capacity for joy. That is not scientific. It's biased. Anthropomorphism is okay. It's often the best first guess about what an animal is doing and why they're doing it. And then if you watch them, you get a much better sense of what they're doing and why they're doing it. But there's no reason to make it out of bounds. Actually, there is a reason to make it out of bounds. If no other species can have a thought or an emotion of any kind, it makes certain things simpler for us. And it tells us our favorite story. Our favorite story is, we are the best. We are special. We're the only ones that really matter. That's our favorite story. So a reporter uh, who was interviewing me when the book first came out, she said, OK, OK, you're telling me all this stuff. You're just telling me all this stuff. But how do you really know that a non-human can think or feel? And I thought, geez, I'm, you know, I was trying to explain all this stuff. I thought I did a pretty good job of explaining it up to now. But then I started thinking of all the research that I read, and I have all these references cited in my book. What's the best one I can think of to cite and explain? And then I realized that the answer to the question, how do I know that a non-human can think or feel, the answer to that question was right on the rug. When my puppy gets up and comes over to me and rolls over on her back, now she comes to me, she doesn't go to the dining room table or to the sofa and rolls over on her back. She comes to me to roll over on her back. And when she does that, it's because she has had a thought. And the thought is, I would like my belly rubbed. <laughs> I'm going to go over to Carl because we are family. I can totally trust him by rolling over and exposing my belly. I know he will know what I'm asking him to do. I know he knows how to do it really well and make me feel good. <laughs> she has thought and she has felt. It's not really a lot more complicated than that. But usually when we see animals, we see them in categories with labels, and we say, oh, look, there's an elephant. Oh, look, orcas. Oh, wolves. That's what we see. That's not how they see it. This tall, finned killer whale here, he is 30, I think he's 39 years old now. That would make, oh, whoa. That would make the female to his immediate left, that would make her, what did I say, 39? That would make her 37 now, I believe. So they have known each other for decades. They know exactly who they are. They know exactly where they are. When they are separated by tens of miles in an ocean where the visibility is about 100 feet, they know how to find each other. They recognize each other's voices. They know what their families sound like. They know who they're with. They know who their friends are. They know who their enemies and rivals are. They know where the food is. They know where to go at certain times. They have lives and they understand their lives. And they know who they're with. 
Here is an elephant named Philo. That is Philo four days later. Humans not only can experience grief, we manufacture an incredible amount of it. We want to carve their teeth. Why can't we wait for them to die? In Roman times, elephants lived all the way from the shores of the Mediterranean to the Cape of Good Hope, except for the absolutely worst parts of the Sahara. In the 1980s, they still held vast stretches of territory in Central and Eastern Africa. And now, they live in tiny little shards and slivers of their former range, and we are grinding those shards smaller and smaller. This is the geography of the grandest life on land being driven to extinction so we can carve their teeth. Of course, in the United States, we are much better stewards of our wildlife. In Yellowstone, park rangers were paid to completely exterminate all the wolves, which was done by the early 1920s. Wolves were exterminated from essentially all of the continents south of Canada, just about. And then for 60 years in Yellowstone, the elk exploded, the deer exploded, all the browse was being eaten, there were a lot of ecological changes, and for that and other reasons, people fought for a couple of decades to bring wolves back to Yellowstone, which they did in the late 90s, and now there are wolves in Yellowstone, and a grand rebalancing act is still trying to find its center there. But in the last couple of decades, people have gone to Yellowstone because it is the easiest and best place in the entire world to actually see free-living wolves. And people who go to Yellowstone just to see wolves, or who make the trip in order to see wolves, primarily to see wolves, they spend about $30 million a year to see wolves in Yellowstone. And um, one of the main packs when I was there working on the book was in the Lamar Valley, the northern tier of the park. This was a very, very stable, very well-known pack led by an exceptional female wolf and two male brothers. Now, a wolf pack is just a nuclear family. There are the breeders, and then there are their children of several years. When the children reach adolescence, they leave to try to find their own stake in the world. We call that a pack when it's wolves. When it's us, we call it our families. But it is a nuclear family. Their social orientation to living in a nuclear family is why we have domesticated wolves lying around in our houses, chewing bones in our present-day caves, instead of things like chimpanzees, which are more closely related to us, but not socially um, very fit to live with us. But these guys are socially fit to live with us. One, um, one distinction, I would say, is that no one has ever heard of a male wolf abandoning his family. At any rate, I went there and I was watching these wolves, and uh, in the fall of 2012, a peculiar thing happened. Somebody in Congress highlighted the word wolf on the endangered species list, and then he hit the delete key. And when this family, the Lamars, left the park in early winter, 
the, uh, the famous female breeder, the leader, the alpha female, um, was almost immediately shot. And then uh, she became probably the only non-human to have her obituary in the New York Times, that flaming leftist liberal newspaper <laughs> from my hometown. Uh, then the other, there were two adult males. One was the breeder and then the breeder's brother. The brother was almost immediately thereafter also shot. So then this extremely stable pack started to immediately descend into total sibling rivalry and chaos, where the, um, the daughters, there were mostly daughters in this family at that point, and they were physically mature. And um, as the father wandered around looking for his wife and his brother, or maybe a new female, or who knows what he was exactly doing during those chaotic uh, first few weeks, two young adult males found the, this family of mostly young adult females, and the most precocious of them was her. You see, she's getting beaten up by her sisters here. She was getting the most attention from those two new males. Now, I can't tell you for sure what goes on in the head of a free-living wolf. I can tell you that I do think dogs are capable of being jealous, and this certainly looked like something having to do with jealousy. At any rate, the fact is that I watched as the most precocious of the sisters was kicked out of her family, forcibly, very much against her will. She tried coming back for days. Actually, she tried over a period of weeks. And um, she was banished. That's the word for it. But she was young. This was the father. Going into winter, he had lost his mate and his brother. Those were the other two adults in the hunting unit. All of his hunting support in the form of his children, his hunting territory, he lost everything. Everything that a wolf needs and a wolf can have, he lost. And I certainly would have bet heavily that she was going to survive and he was doomed. And what happened was she was shot starving at somebody's chicken coop and he is still alive four years later. And he's old now. He's, I think, nine, which is very old for a free-living wolf. And he has a mate, a territory, and a new family. Now that's a story, but the point of that story is that there are animals for whom the death of one of them matters more to the survivors because it changes the entire trajectory of the lives of the ones who survive them because they have relationships. And when relationships suddenly are shattered, everything can change, meaning... They have lives. We hurt them so much that it is mysterious to me that they don't hurt us more than they do. So, because we're here in Seattle, I can tell you that that is Ken Balcom. That little blob in the boat back there is Ken Balcom, the famous researcher from San Juan Island who has done so much for the killer whales and for um, my understanding of them. Now, this happens to be off Davenport, California, and that whale had just finished eating part of a gray whale that he and his companions had killed. But those people in the boat have nothing to fear because no free-living killer whale has ever hurt a human being, which I find kind of strange. 
I took this picture from Ken's deck on San Juan Island. That is T20. He just finished ripping a seal into three with two of his companions. And those people, who probably weigh about the same as the seal weighed, have nothing to be afraid of, which I think is kind of strange. They eat seals. Why don't they eat us? <laughs> Why can we trust them around our toddlers? Ken Balcom and Alexandra Morton, two researchers in two adjacent countries, have two very similar stories with two very different groups of orcas. I'll give you Ken's since we're here. One day, after following a group of orcas for a couple of days, uh, they got enveloped in thick fog and they lost track of the whales. And the whales had been a bit evasive anyway. So he said, okay, well, observation is over. Now, this was a long time ago before GPS or even before Loran. So he said, all right, let's put all the cameras away um, and we'll figure out what direction home is here. We'll just look at the compass and basically head homeward. As soon as they started going, the orcas came back and they got in front of the boat. And Ken said, okay, forget about the compass. Let's just see where the orcas are going to take us. They followed them for 15 miles and suddenly the fog split open and Ken's house was right there on the shoreline. <laughs> and then they left. And up in British Columbia, Alexandra Morton has a very similar story. In the Bahamas, there's a researcher called Denise Herzing, and she studies spotted and bottlenose dolphins, and she knows them very, very well as individuals, like the orcas here are known as individuals. She knows who is whose baby, um, who, who is related to whom, and they all recognize each other. So when she goes back there, they all come over to the boat and they bow right and it's a big happy reunion and she feels like uh, they're all friends. But one time she went and the dolphins would not come near the boat. And she said, what is wrong with the dolphins? They seemed scared of the boat that they knew so well and the people they knew so well. So somebody suddenly comes up from below and announces that a person on board has just died during a nap in his bunk. Now, how could the dolphins have known that one of the human hearts had stopped beating? And why would that matter to them? And why would it spook them? Now, all these stories that I'm telling you, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, it's not to tell you something that I don't know, it's to tell you something that I do know that these stories indicate. What they indicate is there is a lot more going on in the minds that share this planet with us than our minds ever stop to consider. We don't even think about them. In an aquarium in South Africa was a baby bottlenose dolphin named Dolly. And one day, one of the keepers was on a break and he went down outside the pool and he was looking through a window in the pool and he was smoking a cigarette. And Dolly came over in her young curiosity and she looked at him and then she went back to her mother to nurse again and she nursed for a few moments, and then she swam back to the window, and she opened her mouth and released a cloud of milk that enveloped her head like smoke. <laughs> Somehow a nursing age bottlenose dolphin had the idea, I'm going to use milk to copy whatever that guy is doing. When humans use one thing to represent something else, we call that art. <laughs> the things that we think make us human are not the things that actually make us human. 
all the things people think are the thing that makes us human, I see examples of or representations of in some other animals. I don't see anything really that seems to be absolutely our own thing. But I think what makes us human is that we take these things to extremes. We are the extreme animal. We are the most creative and the most compassionate and the most destructive and the cruelest animal that has ever lived. We are all of those things all together. That's us, the animal of extremes. It's not love that makes us human, and love is not the sole province of the human experience. We're not the only animals that care for our partners and our mates. We're not the only animals that care for our children. This is the chain of life. This is the chain of being, passing life from one generation to the next. If the word sacred means anything at all, the continuity of life is the most sacred thing on earth. Albatrosses nest in the remotest islands in the world, and this island is almost dead in the center of the Pacific Ocean, as far from any continent as it is possible to get on this planet. We have no idea that these birds are even there, but they certainly know about us because that's what their home looks like. Into that sacred relationship come things like the screw top to a plastic jar. These birds fly sometimes 5,000, 7,000 miles for two, three, four weeks to come back with one gigantic meal for a chick that needs about six months to grow big enough to fledge. And into this chain of being, this sacred relationship is our garbage. Here's an albatross that was ready to fly. It died. It's packed with red cigarette lighters. This is not the relationship we are supposed to have with the rest of life on Earth. But it is the relationship we actually are having. We've named ourselves after our minds. It would be good if we used those minds to think about some consequences. And despite that, when we are getting ready to welcome new human life, we paint animals on the nursery room walls. We don't paint cell phones. We don't put up political posters. We don't paint work cubicles. We paint animals. Because it seems that without even fully realizing it, we have a wish for our unborn children. And that wish is, welcome to this beautiful world. We welcome you. We are not alone here. We have company. And yet, every creature in any painting you'll see of Noah's Ark, any creature deemed worthy of salvation, is actually in mortal trouble now. And their flood is us. So we started with a question. Do they love us? And we're going to turn that question around a little bit and ask, are we capable of loving them enough? Do we have enough of what it would take 
to simply let them continue to exist. I miss those guys. Thank you so much for being here tonight. You've been great. I really appreciate your time and your attention and coming out and visiting with me. Does anybody have any questions? If you do have questions, please come up to the microphone so we can record your questions and you can line up on either side. Uh, please keep your questions in the form of a question and short. Thank you. Have you heard about something I just saw on the PBS NewsHour Halloween? There was a lovely story about vampire bats and vampire bats will regurgitate blood to starving other vampire bats. Yes, that's true. I, I have known about that, yes. That's a good one, especially for Halloween. Um, yes, sir. Um, you said that chimpanzees don't teach, but I think I saw something on the Guardian website. I think just you, did, the last you did week. see something on the Guardian website saying chimpanzees teach, and when I read that, I thought, they're not teaching. There's, there's a lot of learning going on, but they're not really... Um, the adults are not taking time away to show, here's how you do it, here's how you make this tool. That they didn't seem to be doing that to me. Yes. Our local zoo in Seattle received an anonymous grant this summer to study empathy and empathy of children for animals. They received $750,000. Um, the results of that study haven't been published, uh, but but what do you feel, how do you feel that uh, humans can learn about empathy from animals? Well, how can humans learn about empathy from animals? I think, or I guess, I, I think anim animals give us a, you know, empathy is one of the things that I specifically mentioned. I, I think that we are, you know, the extreme example of an animal that has a capacity for empathy. Some other animals show it. We, we are the, that's one of the things we do in the extreme. And I think, I think other animals, it's, it's, in a sense, it's the best of the most human traits that we have. And I think other animals give us a great opportunity to practice our capacity for empathy because they also present us with a lot of opportunities for, um, well, for cruelty or for just not caring. And I, and I think that they, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of our husbandry and if you look at a lot of how we are with animals, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, it's not so much that we should copy the empathy of other animals. There are many other animals, I think, have... Um, very little of it, and some have a lot of it. Uh, animals like elephants, uh, I think dogs have a lot of empathy, that, those kinds of things. But I think, I think they just present us with, a, with, with one of the best opportunities to exercise and develop the thing about the human mind that I think is one of the best things about the human mind, which is our capacity for empathy and compassion. compassion. Who's next on the line here? Okay, yes. Uh, can you tell us if you are or are not a vegetarian and <laughs> why philosophically you take either approach? Okay. Um, well, I have a slightly longer answer to this question because everybody asks it. I wrote a thing called What I Eat. <laughs> what I Eat by Me, Carl Safina. And if you just Google that, you'll, you'll, get, this, you'll get this essay. Um, what I think, basic, I, I'm not strictly in any category. 
Uh, I'm not strictly a vegetarian. I essentially never order meat from farmed animals. If I go to somebody's home and that's what's for dinner, I usually just eat it um, rather than make anybody feel bad or anything. But in, you know, from time to time, people say to me, well, because you were coming, we decided to make lasagna or we decided to have a veg. The other, I, I spoke at the National Zoo in DC a few nights ago. And they said, because you were coming and talking about animal feelings, we decided for the first time ever at our dinner with all our donors, we're going to have a vegetarian dinner. So that's great, because I didn't have to say anything about it, about it to anybody, and the needle moved. Um, my thinking, you know, I'm basically really an ecologist, and I study wild animals. And what I see in nature is a tremendous amount of dying and killing. I don't think dying or killing is unnatural. We all die, and a lot of predators kill other animals for food. We have, we have certain choices, um, but to me, the thing, the thing about nature is an animal gets to be who it was supposed to be until the moment it gets ambushed. And in our food system, animals mainly never get to be remotely like anything that they were supposed to be. They, they live horrendous, miserable lives for the most part. I think that if we kept animals um, really well and happy and let them be who they're supposed to be and then humanely killed them, we kill animals more humanely than we make them live. I think if we did that, it would be pretty okay. I'm not advocating eating meat, but I think it would be pretty okay. Um, that's not generally what we do. So I, for instance, I live on the coast and I, I go fishing. And, and I have chickens. The chickens are, are, you know, the chicken... Let me talk about the fishing first. Um, I go out and I kill fish. Fish are animals, they're vertebrates, and I eat them. But they got to be who they were supposed to be before I went and killed them. And uh, I used to fish for a wider range of fish. Now I only fish for the ones that I know are still abundant or are increasing in number. And I feel like doing that connects me with my food and I take responsibility for what I eat in that way. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. And I think it's important to know the word enough when you're fishing or hunting or doing anything. I think enough is a, is a word that many people should learn. Um, the chickens that we have, we have half a dozen hens and uh, they are part of the domestic food system. You know, I'm, we just bought them in a store, and uh, we give them... So I feel bad about that. Uh, I feel bad about who they are in their history to that extent, and I feel bad that they cannot turn off their egg laying. Uh, we can't turn it down or anything. They lay an ungodly amount of eggs. <laughs> um, but we have... Incredibly happy chickens, I will say. We let them out every morning. They, they are not confined in any way. They go any place they want to go, um, which is not too terribly far. It's a few hundred feet in any direction. They have little routes and little, uh, little ambits that they do at different times of the day. We feed them lavishly. They graze and eat bugs lavishly. I notice I have, we have other friends that have chickens. When they give us eggs and we crack them side by side, their eggs are pale yellow because they feed them these horrible pellets that our chickens will eat last of anything, and our eggs are bright orange. So we have healthy chickens, and um, they are about as happy as domestic chickens can be, and I feel okay about that. So, uh, so strictly speaking, I'm not vegetarian, I'm not in any category, but I'm very mindful of these things. So that's, that's my answer. And as I said, what I eat in the Huffington Post. So somebody from this side of the room, please. Um, yeah, you say you study mostly wild animals, but um, I don't know if you've studied any animals in a zoo. Um, but Some, when you, when a you bit. When you do, you see the stereotypical behavior of the head bobbing, the pacing, Sometimes, the sometimes, yes. Yeah. Um, so what about our empathy for these animals that we confine primarily for entertainment? Yeah, well, that's, um, that's a, a, you know, a thing that's on a lot of people's minds, and it's a thing that comes up a lot. And often it comes in the question of, uh, are you 
pro or con zoos? Are you for or against zoos? And to me, that's a little bit like asking, are you for or against agriculture? Because there is some really good agriculture that is not harmful and some, a lot of horrendous agriculture. And there are some zoos that I think are really good and um, not harmful, and I think that the animals there have a good experience. And I think that there are some animals that do a lot better in captivity or in zoos than do other animals. Not, every, not everything is equally suited or unsuited to being in captivity. I think zoos are generally on the good side of the equation if overall their whole organization works for the preservation of free living animals. And I think they're on the their business model. That's not what they do. Well, it's it's a lot of what some zoos do. And there are other zoos that um, are just takers, and they make the animals work for them. And I would say they are on the negative side of that ledger. I, I've kept a, a, a large variety of animals in captivity myself, and what I see is that some uh, don't adjust well to captivity. Some don't adjust well to certain kinds of captive situations and are perfectly fine if you set them up with what they need. Um, we have two parrots that were captive bred and uh, we were given, and their cage is open all day. 99% of the time, they're either on their cage or in their cage because it's their home. If they want to go elsewhere, they just go. But they like their home. My chickens go in at night. We close the door. When we close the door, they're locked in there. It's a cage to that extent, but they don't see it as a cage. They see it as their home. And I think that um, in some zoos, you know, when I was a kid, the, the Bronx Zoo, which is one of the best zoos in the world, their, uh, their cages for their cats and their apes and their elephants were like jail cells. They were concrete slabs with big bars. Now you go there and they have these naturalistic settings. They're not pacing. They're not, they, don't, they don't look psychotic. They look bored. So, well, that's is actually a horrible place for elephants. The, happy is alone. Happy is an elephant that's alone at the Bronx Zoo because the Bronx Zoo has decided to end their keeping of elephants, and and the way they've decided to do it is attrition. So now they have one lonely elephant at the Bronx Zoo, the which sanctuary. which is not so good, and. Um, but, you know, but don't, if you're going to ask about zoos, you can't ask about one unhappy elephant or, or elephants even as if, uh, no, but as if that is what all zoos do and that's all they do. There, there, are, there are things that zoos do that are a lot better and there are things that zoos do that are, that are worse. At the National Zoo, they had three elephants that came from Calgary, a terrible place for elephants. They went to the National Zoo. The, the setup there looked pretty okay, and they looked pretty okay to me. I think at the Bronx Zoo, the last time I was at the Bronx Zoo, and I looked at the cats, and I looked at the gorillas and everything, they're all on grass, they're all, uh, they're all in family groupings. The tiger was trying to catch a mallard duck out of its pond by sneaking up on it. Um, it was a far cry from what it was when I was a kid. But a lot of the animals, with the exception of the sea lions, who were nonstop playing, a lot of the animals looked bored, securely bored. In nature, animals get to be who they are all the time and who they're supposed to be all the time. Uh, a lot of them die. A lot of them die young. A lot of them are not very happy a lot of the time. So um, it's not that simple. And it's, not, it's just not the case that an animal in a cage is miserable and an animal in the wild is having a nice life. That's just, just not... I, I mean, I don't think this rates applause, but I, I thank you. But it's just, not, it's just not the way it actually is for animals. It's much, much more nuanced. The question is much more nuanced. I, I will say 
that I think there is one species that um, should never be in captivity. And I think we have learned from keeping them in captivity that they are much different than we assumed they were, uh, that they are much more complicated, much more intelligent, much more emotional, and they should never be in captivity. And that is killer whales. Uh, killer, killer whales swim 75 miles a day. They, they are the only animals known where the juveniles never leave their mother. And in captivity, when they're bred, the, the babies are taken away. The, everybody is in total anguish over that. It just seems to be uh, wrong. I, I don't think that we can scale up a captive situation that could meet the physical or the social requirements of killer whales. That's the, that's the one that I would say uh, categorically should not be in captivity. And yet, ironically, we learned most of what we learned about their abilities uh, through this pretty horrendous period of captivity. But I think it's been a long time since we've learned anything new about them. So I think that the phase out that's happening there is, in this country anyway, is the right one. In China, they're catching lots of elephants from the wild and they're catching lots of killer whales from the wild for all their new zoos and aquariums, which is not a good thought to me. Anyway, I'm sorry. Let's go to this side. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could comment on your views on um, non-human animal testing for health, human health purposes and okay. the underlying human supremacism in that for human sake alone. Yeah, testing on medical testing you're yeah, talking uh, I about. I mean like cosmetics. Not cosmetics, okay. So medical testing on non-humans for human sake alone. I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I think it does depend totally on the trade-offs of what, what you're gaining for what you're inflicting. And I think there are times when it is, uh, I think it's always sad, but there are times when I think it is justifiable and I think there are a lot of times when it's not. I think there's a, there's a lot of crucial research and there's a lot of research that is just totally um, not important. For instance, at the university where I am, there were two chimpanzees in the basement of one building uh, where for, uh, and uh, these were the subject of several lawsuits and a bunch of other um, uh, controversies. And why they were there was that a graduate student who was having a lot of trouble getting her act together and finishing her dissertation was supposedly studying the evolution of bipedalism, walking on two legs, by watching how chimpanzees walked uh, in, with these two chimpanzees who were kept in a basement. Now that strikes me as ridiculous and horrendous and uh, uh, bizarre, you know. Um, but I think that certain kinds of research with certain kinds of animals, um, if kept to a minimum, could be justifiable. I think it depends on what you might get for what you are inflicting. I don't, I, again, I don't think there's, as you can tell, I'm not like an incredible fanatical about a lot of these things, whether it's food or zoos or research. I think a lot of the time the answer is it depends. And um, I obviously care about animals and their experience, but I don't think a lot of these crucial things have one black and white answer. Yes. There's a technology being used on humans, and I'm uh, <clears throat> not sure the name, but it's, I believe they're mapping out parts of the brain that are active with different inputs based on MRIs and how much blood flows through different parts of the brain. I'm wondering if that's been used on some of our uh, fellow creatures. Uh, to me, it may show which... Well react the same as our brain. Yeah, basically so there's a lot of research that I, I'm, I'm nowhere near up on because it's explosive, um, showing many, many similarities in brains. You know, all of the hormones that create mood and motivation in human brains are exactly the same in not only all vertebrate brains, but many invertebrates have the same chemicals in their brains. People, uh, one great thing I saw not too long ago was somebody was looking at, I think it was rats and cats, showing that they have um, not only uh, rapid eye movement sleep, but that during rapid eye movement sleep, 
the exact same kind of brain activity was happening in their brains as happens in humans when we dream. So when your dog is lying there flicking her wrists and going, woof, 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 yes, yes, they're dreaming. So, yes. Um, okay, I guess my role here is to keep alternating <laughs> yes. sides of the room. Um, well, mine's back to the question of does my dog love me? I want to know, do they know how much we love them? Because do they know how much we love really them? You know, I get a feeling, I get a feeling that they do know how much we love them. But they are like people to the extent that there is not just like, you know, dog. Every dog is different. Every dog has a personality. Every dog has a history, whether it's a history of how they were raised or what their breed was or what they were bred for. And so it's kind of like children. You know, do our children know how much we love them? I have a stepdaughter. No, she does not know. She does not know. I, whether she ever will, I hope so. But, yeah, exactly. I know. That's but my dog, my, well, one, I, have, I have these two wonderful dogs, and one of them is very, very expressive. And I feel like, I just feel like when I tell her that I love her, like her mood actually changes as though she understands mm -hmm. yeah. what I'm trying to get across. So I anyway. I just want to note your opinion. Yes. Uh, I noticed in your presentation that you did not use the word or a concept of instinct. And I'm just wondering where that fits in to... I did not use the word instinct in... Well, I, I think there are a lot of instincts. I think we have lots of instincts, and I think many other species have lots of instincts. And I think there is, um, in many, many species, there is some balance between what is instinctive, meaning behaviors that you do not have to learn, but you can execute, and the learning that happens that, um, that you, you either simply learn, or much more commonly, you learn things that help you get your instincts to kick in and execute. So a, an example of that with humans, is we appear to have an instinct for human language that is automatic and pre-enabled. But on top of this, we learn languages. So you can put French in your language instinct, or German, or, or maybe both, or maybe none of those. And w when you learn one language, you, you may not speak the other languages, but you can learn those because you have this pre-adaptation, this language instinct. And if you weren't taught, if a person was somehow not taught a language, they would probably develop um, rudimentary language because that's kind of what we do. Another thing that I think is instinctual for us is uh, you know, sexual attraction and things like that are instinctive. Um, you, you, you usually learn a few things along the way, but um, hopefully, right? Okay. So that's what I, th I think. It's um, I think it's a sort of a balance between nature and nurture, and I think those two things both exist um, to different degrees in in different animals. I, we we know with many animals that we you know use and work with and live with that there are things that they do naturally and things that we also train or train in. And those have both capacities that make it possible and limitations that make some things not able to um, happen. Thank so, you. Okay, great. Yes? My question is uh, conveniently about language. Um, what lingu a segue. Oh, yes, exactly. Um, Linguists believe that uh, what uh, one of the things that uh, distinguishes humans from other species is that our communication system uniquely uh, includes syntax. So we have a recursive yes, uh, syntax and grammar, system. right? Yes. So what is your thought on that? Right. Yeah, I think I don't think there's um, asterisk, which I'll get to. I, I don't think there is. Um, another language in any other species as well developed as human language is with its complex syntax and grammar. There are some species that have words, 
um, uh, chimpanzees and gorillas in the wild where they have the benefit of being raised with all of the communication that has developed, unlike the captive ones, which are the offspring of juveniles who were taken from mothers who were shot, who never got to learn anything, so I don't think you can tell much about communication from captive apes. Wild apes have several dozen words or communicative gestures that mean specific things or mean some envelope of several possibilities and are directed at some people. Some animals have syntax. They can say, um, if they do one call before the other, it means one thing, or if they don't precede one call with the other call, it means something else. There are certain, um, I think it's gibbons, where um, if they do these two calls together, it means leopard right here, and if they don't do the first one, it means I see a leopard somewhere out there. And there are monkeys and other things that have words for things. When I was in Trinidad, and our birding guide said, I hear the motmot saying there's a snake. Oh. So we walked like half a mile to where the motmot was up in a tree with a boa, and there were other birds mobbing the, the boa, and the, you know, the bird guide heard the motmot word for snake. So there are, so there are words, but there's not this um, complex thing. The asterisk is that you can teach dolphins, in captive setting, you can teach dolphins the, um, the command, do something new, do something we haven't taught you, innovate something. And they will go to the bottom of the pool and circle around, and then they'll leap out, spinning to the right while squirting water out to the left, or do something that no one ever taught them to do. And uh, it appears that somehow they have gotten this extremely complicated plan across to one another. I don't know, but that's what the scientists, I mean really good scientists, wrote about and saying that they were totally flabbergasted and they had no idea what was going on. So there may be, with, with dolphins, with, with killer whales, which are dolphins, with some other species, there may be some... Uh, very complicated verbal abilities there that we have not detected yet what the channels are. Like, we didn't know that they had sonar until 1960 or so. We just didn't know it existed. Um, there must be something that they're doing, there may be something that they're doing that we just don't know exists that allows them to actually have this kind of conversation. But if they do, we don't know about it yet. And the other thing... Um, which is not really part of your question, but your question reminds me of, is that there are a lot of animals, like a lot of primates and like elephants, for example, they understand who is whose baby. They understand um, who ranks higher than another. They'll get confused if you um, play a sound out of a speaker that makes them think that um, there's been a hierarchy flip in their group. And as it was put in a, in a book that I just read, that I, I have to write a review about, um, the, the researcher put it this way, that, that with baboons, he was talking about baboons, their understanding of the world is much more detailed and much more nuanced than anything they could say about it. So even though they don't have the language that we have, which has obviously tremendous advantages because we can network all our brains and we can learn what people who are dead had to say and things like that. Um, and they don't seem able to do anything like that. But their, uh, their lack of language and lack of words does not translate into uh, inability to know in great detail and great working detail what their life is about. So those are some of my thoughts about that. So on yes. language again, do our dogs and cats know what we're saying? Do our dogs and cats know what we're saying? Sometimes. <laughs> they know the word treat, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes they know what we're saying. Most of the time, I don't think they know. I think, that, you know, I think it's like blah, 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 food, blah, 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 <laughs> car, um, that kind of, 
you know, and our dogs know some things. They know if I, if I say, where's mommy, they go, one, one of the dogs, one of the dogs goes <laughs> running all around the place looking for my wife. And the other dog is like, I don't know. Uh, the, brown, the brown one. She's, she's the one who's the real, the real character and the real interactive one. Yes? Do you think uh, the more capacity a species has for compassion, they in turn also have for cruelty? Do I think that the more, the more capacity a species has for compassion, the more capacity they have for cruelty? Well, there is no other species I know of that seems to use its capacity for empathy to inflict pain and enjoy that, which I think is the definition of cruelty. I think when a cat is playing with a mouse, I think they're just playing with the mouse. I don't think they are trying to hurt it or enjoying the thought that it is in anguish and pain and shock and confusion and fright. I think they're just playing. Um, I, 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 the only ones that I see that appear to enjoy the idea that suffering is being inflicted and experienced is people. And so I guess I would have to say in one example the answer to your question is yes. We have humans and animals, but we also have cell phones. And uh, it's my experience that when I'm with my girlfriend's dog and she's not there, and I let the dog hear my girlfriend's voice, she recognizes the voice, but she feels very uncomfortable. Ah, that's interesting. Well, um, I've tried that, and I've had, the, I've had the impression that our dogs don't recognize voices on the phone, and I've wondered about that. But um, there's probably a cognitive dissonance thing, which is usually if they can hear the voice of somebody that they know, they can smell their presence, and they can sense them in all the other different channels that they use, of which um, hearing is just one. So it may be that they're uncomfortable because it confuses them and they're not really sure what's going on. I don't know, but that, that is the first thing that occurs to me anyway about that. So, Dogs apparently can recognize photographs of faces of people they know and respond differently to photographs of people that they know and people that they don't know. And, and I think photographs of dogs that they know, too. I might be getting it mixed up with a study I saw about chimps, where chimps clearly recognized, this is good, and this is good to end on, they clearly recognize the faces and the butt ends of chimps they know well. <laughs> so, thank you. Do you have a question? Yes. Oh, sure, I get to you, okay? Yeah. Just, just one more question. Thank, thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs>